Good evening. On behalf of the Leo Beck Institute, New York, Berlin, I would like to welcome our panelists and all of you to the closing session of our Conference on Shared History, 1700 Years of Jewish Life in German-Speaking Lands. My name is Billy Weitzer, and I am the Executive Director of the LBI, New York, Berlin. As I hope you all know by now, this conference highlights LBI's Shared History Project, marking the 1700th anniversary of Emperor Constantine's edict, granting Jews the rights and responsibilities that come with access to public offices. Throughout the year 2021, the LBI, along with our partners and contributors, will utilize exhibits, conferences, and other programs to tell the story of 1700 years of Jewish life in German-speaking lands. As with nearly everything during the COVID-19 pandemic, planning a conference was made much more difficult. We are pleased and thankful for the interest shown by those who submitted papers for the conference and the 24 papers that were eventually selected. I also wanna thank the presenters and all of you for adapting to the changing circumstances which led to this virtual format. The opening session and the eight paper sessions held over the last three years have demonstrated the breadth, depth, and importance of Jewish participation in the history of German-speaking lands. We at the LBI hope that you will stay connected to the Shared History Project as we reveal objects and tell stories that illuminate this rich history. Tonight, our panelists will discuss shared history, reflections on a complex interplay, certainly a fitting topic for our closing conversation. Shortly, we will welcome Shelley Kupferberg, journalist and moderator, whose work regularly focuses on culture and literature, as well as topics such as civil society, democracy and participation, discrimination, and migration. Shelley will introduce our two panelists, Professor Dr. Raphael Gross, president of the Foundation for the German Historical Museum, and Ambassador Michaela Kuchler, representative for relations with Jewish organization, issues relating to anti-Semitism, international Sinti and Roma affairs, and Holocaust remembrance at the Foreign Office in Germany. I extend my deep gratitude in advance to the panelists for their participation. Before the panel begins, we will hear a special greeting from Ambassador Dr. Felix Klein. Ambassador Klein previously held Ambassador Kuchler's position in the Foreign Office, and now is the Federal Government Commissioner for Jewish life in Germany. I am grateful for Felix's advice and support as a leader, friend, and colleague. Ladies and gentlemen, as the Federal Government Commissioner for Jewish Life in Germany and the fight against anti-Semitism, I am happy to have this opportunity to address a few words to you at this conference. Next year, we will be celebrating 1,700 years of Jewish life in Germany. As participants in this conference, you are commemorating this anniversary in a particularly relevant, timely way through critical reflection, analysis, discussion and thought-provoking input. Yours is a scholarly contribution and this scholarly approach is exactly what we need. At a time when disinformation is gaining the upper hand in many people's minds and facts are being ousted by fake news, conspiracy theories and irrational thought patterns, it is all the more important for science and scholarship to take a stand and assert themselves as an antipode to these tendencies. The Leo Beck Institute has been dedicated to researching German-Jewish history and culture since its foundation and has done invaluable work in this field. The point of departure for its shared history project is precisely where the zeitgeist gives rise to distortions of history and anti-Semitic enemy images. Those destructive narratives are countered using own narratives, fact-based narratives about 52 historical objects opening up a new way of accessing Jewish history. They explain the individual artifact but also illuminate the context and have the overarching situation in view. 
I am convinced that the fascination of these narratives is also an effective means of combating the devastating effect of anti-Semitic patterns of interpretation and conspiracy theories that are currently poisoning our social climate. Shared history shows us how fascinating facts can be. Using an innovative concept for imparting knowledge, it shows us that the appeal of reality is frequently greater than the appeal of lies. And this message, this signal is so important, especially right now. Not least for that reason, the federal government supports the project Shared History with total conviction. The individual objects and their stories also illustrate the major overarching themes that have always characterized the existence of Jewish people. Life as a minority, migration, social inclusion and exclusion, questions of identity and self-positioning. You have been addressing these issues over the last three days. These are issues of growing importance for our coexistence because they affect not only the Jewish community, but the whole of our society. We are experiencing increasing religious and cultural diversity. Questions of migration and integration are an issue that is high on the political agenda. Dealing with religious, cultural, social minorities and shaping coexistence in a heterogeneous society have become central themes for us. The Shared History Conference focuses on precisely these phenomena, thus making not only a particularly interesting, but also a particularly forward-looking contribution to the anniversary year. I would like to thank you for your contribution to the conference and look forward to the virtual exhibition that will be the second part of the project, which, through your efforts, has got off to such a promising start. Thank you very much. Ja, soweit einige Worte von Felix Klein. Thank you very much for your um, words of welcome and introduction, Billy Weitzer and Felix Klein. This is going to be the closing panel of the conference. Shared history, um, reflections on a complex interplay. Uh, that is the topic of this closing panel, and that's what we are going to talk about. Us, that is Ambassador Michaela Küchler. I'm really happy that you're here. Thank you. And Professor Dr. Raphael Gross is here as well. Hello. Ja, hallo aus dem Jüdischen Museum Berlin. Gerne hello from the Jewish Museum Berlin. We would have liked to have you here as a physical audience, but this was impossible. Oh, that's clear. So we're quite um, happy that it's possible to talk to you through the media and um, to have an exchange as well. So if you have any comments to make, if you have any questions, uh, maybe questions from other panels that you would still like to ask here in this closing panel, you are welcome to do this. You can use the chat that's active and open now, and you can ask your questions there. And I'm happy to point out that we have uh, great simultaneous interpreters in the interpreting booth who have done great work over the last days. So thank you very much, Julia Mate and Martina England, who are working at this moment. So I am sure if the audience were here, they would now applaud. Now you just have to imagine that. I have been introduced already. My name is Shelley Kupferberg, and I am a moderator for the Public Broadcasting Service. And as I promised to you, um, I'm going to introduce the panelists to you now. Michaela Küchler is the ambassador of the Federal Foreign Office and the Special Representative for Relations to Jewish Organizations, Holocaust Remembrance, Fighting Antisemitism and International Matters of uh, Sinti and Roma. So these are um, wide-reaching topics. She cooperates with international organizations. Um, the 
like the UNESCO, the European Union. She is responsible for the cooperation with Israel and France and the OSCE and uh, the fight against anti-Semitism and the dialogue with Jewish organizations in Germany, the US and um, Eastern Europe and also the remembrance of um, the Holocaust and the genocide of the Sinti and Roma. And she is the head of the International Alliance of uh, Holocaust Remembrance and is especially active in the field of falsification of historical Professor facts. And yeah. Professor yeah. Raphael Groß has been the president of the Foundation of the German Historical Museum since April 2017. Many know him as the director of the, the Simon Dubnov Institute um, for Jewish History and Culture at the University of Leipzig. And um, he was also the director of the Jewish Museum in Frankfurt, where he curated spectacular exhibitions um, that um, got a lot of attention and awareness beyond Germany. He is the uh, he was the director of the Leo Beck Institute in London and the director of the Fritz Bauer Institute in Frankfurt, and he's also a member of the Commission for the Return of um, Cultural Goods. Um, from uh, Jewish ownership. So the whole thing that we want to talk about here today, the whole panel is a room for reflection. And um, we know that there are more questions than there are answers about the questions of shared history. The translation itself has posed many problems, especially into German, uh, because geteilte Geschichte in German could also be understood as separate history. But we would like to talk about uh, the overall um, topic. So maybe first of all, we should try to define um, the the meaning of the title, Ms. Küchler, um, do we focus on the whole or on the individual elements today during this discussion, this evening? Well, first of all, I would like to thank the Leo Beck Institute in New York for this great start of um, the project, which is going to um, keep us busy and uh, interested for the whole of next year. 1,700 years of Jewish life in Germany and the Leo Beck Institute has um, widened this uh, ge geographical era to all the German-speaking countries, and I think that was a very um, relevant gesture and move. Uh, separated history, shared history. Well, for me, it's clear that uh, we share this history. But uh, maybe that's wishful thinking from my German perspective. Um, maybe a Jew in the Middle Ages who had to live in the ghetto and wasn't able to live anywhere else, or somebody who had to um, uh, swear the Jewish uh, the, the Jewish oath and then ha was expelled from Nuremberg, um, maybe he wouldn't have said that this was shared history, but just experienced um, separation and exclusion. So maybe uh, we can talk about um, shared history after the time of the Enlightenment. Uh, after the 19th or 18th century until maybe um, the dark hour of um, the Second World War in the first half of the 20th century, um, let's say until 1933 or the years before that actually, because of course um, the pressure on Jews was increasing, had been increasing for quite a while. So shared history, well, we share this history, of course, everybody has their own role to play, but um, but it's also, um, there are separating elements in it, that's clear. Okay, let's ask the historian, Raphael Groß, what do we understand as shared history? How do we understand this um, overall, and what does it mean in the context of German history? So thank you from my side of the Leo Beck Institute in New York. Um, thank you for inviting me at the end of this big conference. And um, it was very strange for me. 
um, to have this through computers, but I uh, was starting to get used to it. So as the um, when the director of the Leo Beck Institute, Billy Weitzer, um, approached me and talked to me about the shared history conference, I was a bit doubtful about what I would um, be saying during the closing panel because um, as you already said, uh, the title shared history has so many meanings and um, I wasn't sure how I would interpret it and uh, what kind of research I would like to see um, happening in this project. So I would say all history is shared history for all people. So a shared history is something that happens all the time because we all share the history of the world. But um, what do we mean in this specific case? What do we mean when we talk about uh, German Jewish history? This is where things become more complex. Um, Michaela Küchler already pointed out um, that we have to define first what century we are talking about. Do we talk about the era of emancipation? Do we talk about the time before that? Do we talk about the Holocaust or the time after 1945? So I would say that uh, the Leo Beck Institute as an institution has influenced uh, the writing of history, German Jewish history, um, in the 1950s, or they even invented it, because before that uh, there was no such thing as German Jewish written history as a subject. And Leo Beck Institute um, was the institution that started that. Um, so there are certain questions that uh, we were always especially interested in, the history of emancipation. Was that a success story or was it a failure? Uh, Ranat Rurup um, emphasizes that it's a success story or was it a mm, story that was doomed to fail from the beginning? So um, what's specific about the German Jewish history and is it different from other countries, especially the combination of the idea that legal emancipation leads to a kind of assimilation, culturally speaking or religiously speaking or socially speaking, that these two are coupled. Um, this idea uh, was shared by Jews and non-Jews in the 18th and 19th century in German-speaking lands. And in France, that wasn't the case. In France, you had the same legal rights, the same legal situation, first the women, then the peasants, and then the Jews. And um, that happened during the uh, revolution. And in the German-speaking lands, um, there was this aim of um, a social mobility. And um, maybe this caused resistance right from the beginning, because social inclusion was uh, kind of part of the emancipation uh, problem. So that is something that people don't agree on yet. So um, I would like to add something about the history after 1945, after the Holocaust. I feel that, um, well, it became clear to me during my preparation to this conference that um, there are people who are very interested in this um, German Jewish history, Germans who are very interested in this part of our history. And um, I ask myself, why are they so interested in it? And I would say they are interested in it because of the Holocaust. Let me give you one specific example. In the office next to me in the Jewish Museum, that I was directing for 10 years in Frankfurt, there was an overall edition of the yearbooks of the Leo Beck Institute. And this um, edition was passed on to us from a scientist who was an expert on statistics, and he worked through all these yearbooks. He was a member of the uh, Circle of Friends of the Leo Beck Institute and was extremely fascinated by Jewish history and worked through all the details of these yearbooks. And he was somebody who who um, people don't know anymore um, today. He um, 
was the one who wrote the report for Himmler about uh, the murder of the European Jews and then presented that uh, report to Hitler. So he was the expert for Nazi statistics. And he was extremely interested in Jewish history and part of the member of the supporters of the Leo Beck Institute. So he had his own personal interest in that Jewish history. So people tend to think that scholarly interest uh, prevents you from being a bad person. But in German history, that is not true, as this um, office neighbor of mine shows. Another person who gave me just as much to think about um, is a man who was, um, well, it's quite well-known story. He was the chief editor of the Pieper Publishing House. He was responsible for the books that Hannah Arendt published with his publishing house. His name was Rösner. He used to be a high-ranking official of the SD, the Sicherheitsdienst or Security Service of the NSDAP, the Nazi Party. In his position as SS Obersturmbannführer, he was responsible for the department C3 on Culture and Arts. And he was the editor of Hannah Arendt's book on Rahel Warnhagen and later also of her book on Eichmann in Jerusalem. He wrote her long scholarly letters about how she should be interpreting Jewish emancipation and the success and failures of Rahel Warnhagen. And he tried to convince her, as we were able to show uh, in the letters which we displayed in our Aren exhibition in the History Museum, that the word Jew should not be part of the German translation of the title. Because, as he said, it wouldn't be popular and she should rather focus on romanticism. And he also interfered a lot with her book on Eichmann. So this means that there are many different interests involved in our shared history. For me, it is not so easy to say that shared history is a positive notion and we can all identify with it. I would say shared history is a multifaceted term and there are different interests involved. Some of which I personally agree with and... Um, find worthwhile and relevant, while others are very problematic and we should be aware of this. And I noticed that there hasn't been any scientific research so far examining who is actually interested in, hin in history and why. Well, maybe there's somebody in the audience here today who thinks, finally, I have the topic for my PhD thesis. We see that these questions are not easy to answer. I thank you very much, Raphael Gross, for these very impressive examples, for these paradox continuities that make this topic so problematic. Now I would like to move from your interesting practical examples to the work of Ms. Küchler. Ms. Küchler, how do you experience the question of identity in your work with Jewish organizations? How do they negotiate the question of belonging and their relationship to the majority society and the field of tension around that? Well, in the beginning, I felt quite tense about that. I come from a family that is part Jewish, as my grandfather was Jewish, But apart from some memories, it didn't play a role in my childhood and my youth. I was never in touch with Jews. It was only through my work that I got in touch with Jewish organizations. At the beginning, I was feeling a little self-conscious, but I realized right away that this wasn't necessary. I believe that there are specifically Jewish points of view. I notice, for example, that now, during the pandemic, when I open the newspaper, Jüdische Allgemeine, or other Jewish publications, that they have a very strong focus on the protection of life. There is, for example, a trend to get vaccinated in order to protect others. This point is highlighted much less in the German mainstream media.
and it's very interesting to have the specifically Jewish view on things because um, this is an enrichment and I'm very happy that uh, in 700 years this element is very topical, of course, but it also existed in history in the past. It will give you more emphasize that more people, uh, the attention of more people is raised um, and this is very, makes it very interesting. And I think that we Germans link Jewishness very strongly to the Holocaust. We tend to do so and we see Jews as victims of national socialist persecution and we just forget about the centuries before that and turn a blind eye to it. And therefore, this is uh, an excellent opportunity to broaden our view. Yes, um, of course, this um, is a very important thing to have different points of view. Uh, we see this especially in Germany when we talk about um, 30 years of transformation, political transformation. 30 years later, we had interesting um, opinions about the transformation, um, but um, the wall is just one example. We can um, also talk about um, the night of programs, the crystal night, for instance. Um, is it normal? Is it something um, which is natural that we have completely different standpoints and viewpoints? Is the Holocaust a shared history in the sense of inclusive history? Can we um, say that? As I try to explain at the beginning, this term is very diverse, of course, and um, Of course, um, you can also use the term shared history, but you can also um, talk about the violence, violent history. The, the, the question is, what is your aim, your goal? We see, when we talk about the German colonialism, there is a, a strong necessity to talk about the shared history like the German Southwest Africa, for instance. So how can we use this term? How um, are we talking about huge acts of violence, events of violence, um, genocide, crime against humanity? Um, of course, there is not only one simple uh, viewpoint, not one simple history that you can reconstruct as a shared history. Um, it's very much um, about the conception of the idea that historians or uh, politicians from different take a stand from different um, positions and different biographies and discuss the story of these countries uh, together so that they don't do it um, in separate um, views. And I would like to uh, come back to the history of the Leo Beck Institute that was established in 1955 and uh, has a very long-standing successful history, a very international history, could never uh, decide to establish an institute in Germany. There are uh, There is a lot of discussion around this, and of course they have a dependence, uh, but not an institute in itself. And this, uh, was, this has been very contested, uh, but it's been uh, 20, it was 20 years ago that there were strong frictions within the institute um, about the question of doing so because they always had the idea that uh, there are very different perspectives and we don't want to mix them, to mingle them. There was a scientific working group of the Lebeck Institute with a very long and very complex, com complicated uh, title um, 
And then there was another, like a subsidiary of uh, the Leo Beck Institute New York, but it was not an independent uh, institute. And um, this is maybe because uh, there is an idea that uh, historians have different ideas, different standpoints, different biographies. And um, when it started in the 50s, there were um, functionaries of the, the German Jewry who escaped, um, or maybe children who were exiled in children's transports, for instance, and I um, had the opportunity to got to know them. John Ganville, uh, he left off Berlin after the Crystal Night, uh, just to name one of the examples, and many of them were uh, very strongly threatened, but managed to escape, and they lost a lot of family members. And they um, recorded the, the, the memories of this story, and it took many years until they found a shared history, a joint history, and uh, maybe the majority of the German Jewish Jewish history has been written in Germany. This is a very long story, and it's very interesting to have a look at it. Yes, thank you very much for your thoughts and uh, this strong hesitation to face uh, these terms. And we have one uh, remark from the audience. Uh, well, the term shared history was strongly rejected because history is not shared, uh, not equally divided, not equally shared. Uh, neither uh, the Jewish history nor uh, colonialism. Uh, we could maybe we could use entangled history would be much better. Well, thank you very much for this uh, remark. And we have a question, a very concrete question. How do we deal with the stories and histories of uh, social of uh, minorities? Because one third of the German population are post migrants. Why does the German government not fund or not uh, support these places of uh, democracy history? And the post migrant stories are just forgotten. Maybe this is a question to Ms. Küchler. Well, I, I, I would counter and, and ask, I, 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 do you think so? Because next year, we will have uh, the opportunity to um, see the, the anniversary of um, the recruitment agreement between Germany and Turkey. And I remember a visit to an uh, immigration museum in Bremen. There is a small, maybe in the meanwhile, a bigger uh, annex dealing with immigration to Germany, the history of immigration. So, of course, we realize that there is a history of immigration, maybe not that strongly as a history of majority society. Um, there is uh, more space for action. But um, I wouldn't say that this is true. So the 50 years anniversary of this recruitment agreement with Turkey is something that um, appreciate uh, the contribution of immigrants uh, who came to Germany in the 50s and 60s. But maybe there could be a chair for migrant history in a university, of course. Yeah, these perspectives um, have been uh, actually demanded in the last 30 years after the fall of the wall, of course. Um, First of all, we had to admit that uh, there is a, that we are a migrant society. There is migra migration, and first of all, I would like to speak about um, about the occasion of this conference, 700 years of Jewish history in Germany. We've heard a lot about it with different objects and exhibition and objects that will be shown on an internet platform telling a story. Ms. Küchler, what are the potentials behind this? You 
mentioned that um, it's uh, very uh, good to uh, speak about something else uh, than the Holocaust. Uh, because we always uh, mention uh, this topic. But what potentials do you see in this um, narrative or this story of 700 years of shared history? What are the new questions that are raised, new approaches? Well, first of all, 700 years of Jewish life in Germany means uh, that probably there had been a much longer uh, history because uh, this number is based on a document from the year 321, and it's a question pl uh, put to the Emperor Constantine, are Jews allowed to um, have a public office in Cologne? And if such a question is raised, then you can assume that Jews um, had lived in Cologne before, of course, and this was not the first moment that they just appeared. It's not just these 700 ye uh, years, 1700 years. And this is something that should make us proud that um, there was, um, there has been a minority in Germany for such a long time. I think that there is a, a great opportunity uh, in uh, the fact that the Leobeck Institute decided for a digital format because this enables uh, a lot of people to participate. If it was an exhibition, a physical exhibition in Berlin, um, or a traveling exhibition passing different places in Germany, then uh, only those people could see the exhibition who go there in a digit digital format. The whole world can participate. And uh, we, as a Federal Foreign of Office, we would like to make a contribution by asking our uh, representations abroad to make some marketing for this uh, series of events um, in their countries. There are different objects uh, shown by the Leobeck Institute, religious, secular objects, objects linked to persecution, linked to success. And I think this will open up new avenues to uh, deal with the diversity, the multifaceted Jewish life, lives. Maybe we find parallels and, of course, uh, maybe m more people will deal with these topics and we hope that uh, people will uh, not reject it when they get to know um, this story. And there will be more acceptance for Jewish minority in Germany. And now I ask uh, our audience, what opportunities do you see in this um, kind of uh, dealing with history, even if um, the, 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 the number of years is not necessarily uh, true, but um, I'm very much interested in what aspects can you think of? Um, how can we think of history? I am, uh, because it's at least 700 years uh, of Jewish history, this is something that uh, the Jewish Museum tries to depict, or more, even more, 2,000 uh, years of Jewish history up to the present, and what opportunities, what chances do you see in this, um, how do you, th what other aspect, um, aspects can we have? Well, I think this is very exciting. This uh, long time is very helpful because it enables different perspectives. The last exhibition I did in Frankfurt in the Jewish Museum was an exhibition about Jews in the north provinces of uh, the Roman Empire in times when there was no Christianity at all, but they already had um, uh, they had Jewish settlements in Eisenstadt or in Cologne at some uh, individual places. And uh, we did uh, this exhibition uh, because we had no idea about it. It's a very complicated and very difficult task to deal with this. And I think that it opens up new perspectives. 
and I believe that it uh, makes it possible to question certain terms, concepts uh, in connection, used in connection with Jewish history, with German history, and to have a new look at them, because I'm always very careful uh, when I talk about minorities. I, I, I avoid using the word minorities when I talk about Jewish history or Jews, because I think minority is a legal term which is strongly linked to the 20th century and Versailles, and it's usually a language minority like the Sorbs, or because I think German Jews didn't want specific rights, uh, they just wanted equal rights. They never demanded minority rights like Jews in Poland or in Eastern Europe, where there were cl were clearly were a minority as Jewish communities, but in German lands, this was different. Therefore, they did not define themselves as minorities. They used the term Um, citizens, German citizens of Jewish belief. This is what they used, but they did not consider themselves Jewish minority, and they never demanded specific rights. They just wanted to have the same rights, and this is a huge difference to Jewish history in other parts of Europe, and it's very specific, very particular in Germany. And um, maybe this could be linked to this 1700 years of history. And it's a huge uh, difference when we talk about migrant societies because uh, Jews never considered themselves being a migrant minority or mi migrant community, but they um, actually uh, they had the opinion that they've always been there. And this is a very interesting point because we talked about um, how to talk about German-Jewish relations after 45, but we can also talk about Heine or Hermann Cohen. These um, tries to establish uh, Germanness, Jewishness, these play a very important role in uh, the 18th, 19th, and 20th century. And after the Holocaust, we think that this is very awkward because you just can't imagine something like that. Yes, the Jewish symbiosis is also an important question, yes. Thank you very much for this uh, differentiation. You can ask your questions, you can make remarks, um, Now, especially in Germany with this history, remembrance policy or poly remembrance is a very important point. And now I would be very interested in uh, this narrative that you don't consider yourself being a minority, but a German citizen of Jewish belief. You can find another definition, of course. Michele Küchner, what does it mean in, ter in, in terms of remembrance? Um, do we have to find a new approach in our remembrance politics? Thank you, Rafael Cruz, for those explanations on the topic of minorities. Um, I actually didn't mean it in a legal sense. I totally agree to what you said. And um, remembrance policy in, German is, in Germany is always linked to the Holocaust, closely linked to the Holocaust, restricted even to it. So at the moment we are discussing about um, what it means for uh, the commemoration of remembrance policy uh, when uh, the eyewitnesses um, are not alive anymore. Who can take over the role? Can we preserve their um, reports digitally? So you mentioned a new aspect. Um, how do we deal with the fact that those who have been murdered during the Holocaust 
actually always saw themselves as part of the very society that killed them and demanded equal rights rather than minority rights, saw themselves as citizens of this country. That's a very interesting aspect, and I do think that we um, need to take account of that in our uh, commemora commemoration remembrance uh, policy. I don't have a conclusive answer to that now. Yes, that's what we're here for uh, on this panel, to think together. I think we're going to go home with more questions than answers. And I think that's not a bad thing, because I'm a journalist, and that's my nature. Yes, I started my remarks with um, Richard Koher and Hans Rösner as drastic fascist personalities interested in history. And um, I just wanted to highlight that thinking about history, being interested in hin history, doesn't necessarily mean that you have um, um, the um, political positions that we like, um, because Himmler's uh, statistical expert was massively interested in Jewish history, I have to say, even uh, decades after the um, war. And I think it's the same thing about uh, commemoration and remembrance. There was one filmmaker who died this year or last year, Colland. He came from a German Jewish history, uh, sorry, family. He uh, lived in England and he approached me several times when I was working for the Fritz Bauer Institute and he kept saying, um, I'm interested in the memories of the perpetrators. I want to collect the memories of the perpetrators. And nobody supported him. He went to the um, er uh, Stiftung Erinnerung, Verantwortung und Zukunft and all kinds of other foundations. And nobody supported him as if these memories were not valuable and as if these memories were not influential for Germany in the decades after the war. But these memories are totally excluded. We are interested in the Shoah Foundation, in the Spielberg Foundation, in the family histories of Jewish um, families, and um, we um, think this is very important, and it is, uh, but we ignore the um, history of the perpetrators uh, because there's a lot that we can learn from that as well. And there's a vacuum regarding that. And I think it would be helpful if we would enlarge and or widen our um, understanding of commemoration policy. And commemoration policy or commem commemoration culture is one of the terms I don't like because it sounds as if it's a positive thing to remember the Holocaust, a romantic thing kind of, and it's not. I never accepted that as a positive thing. And um, I think it's it's more it's more complex, it's more multifaceted than that. And um, I think these um, topics can become empty and shallow with time if you see them uh, from a one-sided point of view. And I think it would become more interesting again if we would also focus on the perpetrator's perspective. There was one panel discussion about the Israeli uh, film The Flat, Hadira. It's an Israeli film that shows how complex history actually is and um, how this couple who moved from Germany to um, Israel because they were Jewish kept up their friendship with the German uh, Nazi couple or rather a German couple that became uh, a Nazi couple after they met and they continued their friendship even after the war. And I think that's a very fascinating story because these are the complex aspects of history and it's a daring, um, courageous step to um, make a film about such a complex topic. And I think that's important. Raphael Gross, um, when you were the head of the Leo Beck um, of the Institute, um, did you invent a new term for the commemoration culture, the term you don't like? Well, no, I think it doesn't mean sen uh, make sense to just replace that term. I think um, 
you need to ask different questions. Uh, and I wasn't the head. Uh, I was the head of the Fritz Bauer Institute, where we had this uh, working um, group on commemora commemoration culture. And at the Fritz Bauer Institute, I then said that um, we should talk about um, moral and national socialism because we found that, as you see, even today, for example, with the corona deniers, that these are often very moral-based or pseudo-moral-based um, viewpoints. The points brought forward by these groups um, the points that anti-Semitic stereotypes are based on are often very moral, and they're based on moral grounds or pseudo-moral grounds. So I'm interested in the way that shared morals or shared pseudo-morals are actually relevant for society, and in what way did National Socialism manage to strengthen these moral viewpoints? And what was left of that after 45? What was the echo of it? Um, Martin Walser um, had a famous speech in the Powell's uh, Church um, about, well, and, and I asked myself about the echo of these uh, stories. So in the audience, don't forget to ask your questions. You, um, to summarize it, you um, want us to look at the gray zones of morals as well. And I'm very grateful for that idea. It's very interesting. Yes, I would just like to add that, of course, there are places where research on uh, the perpetrators is done, for example, the topography of terror, and Stanislav Hans' um, book about the command of Sobibor. But of course, that's not so much compared to the research on the victims and research on uh, the suffering of Jews in National Socialism. Yes, and I think there's also a kind of silence in uh, the families of the perpetrators. I think in the Jewish families, uh, there is um, more communication about uh, these stories, although there's also a lot of silence. But in the perpetrators' families, there's um, an overwhelming silence, which also means um, or leads to a disbalance in our memories of the past. Yes, there's an institute in Bielefeld that carried out a study on how family histories are talked about, and half of our population in Germany um, is convinced that their family members were resistance fighters. They were in the opposition or in the resistance. So um, that's an interesting outcome of that silence. And we thought about the role of a Jewish museum. Um, would there be a Jewish museum without the Holocaust? What would the museum exhibit? Um, maybe still the stories of pogroms? Or would it be a folkloric institution? Uh, do we need Jewish museums? Isn't that something that separates our society? Yes, I came across that uh, question just recently because I read a statement by a young person who said um, that Jews for him are something from the past. He was interested in Jews and in Jewish life, and that he asked all his questions in the past tense. He never thought about uh, Jews living in Germany now. so. I thought myself, does a Jewish museum not maybe um, increase that um, impulse or that dinosaur effect? Uh, 
I was here in the Jewish Museum Berlin with my kids recently, and I was very happy about um, the big share of the Jewish present in the exhibition. There was videos that are shown of Jews uh, who live in Berlin now and report from their life as it's taking place today, report from their religious practices or of the fact that they don't have any religion. So um, I found that very impressive and uh, very positive, and I think it's extraordinarily important uh, for a Jewish museum to include present, the present, uh, to prevent the dinosaur effect, as you called it. Yes, and I think this museum is doing it extremely well, especially in the new permanent exhibition. And um, by the way, in Germany, um, I keep hearing in, in Germany we have a very diverse Jewish community with um, a multitude of, of interesting voices, all kinds of religious um, religious groups combined in this community, so small but very interesting. Raphael Groß, do you see it that way as well? Because you're from Switzerland and you've also lived in London and other parts of the world. Do you perceive it like that? Well, first let me say something about the Jewish museums. They have a very important role to play in Germany. Um, talking about uh, Jewish life in the past and today. The Jewish museums are extremely important in Germany because they are museums for non-Jews. The um, Jewish Museum in Frankfurt had a predecessor, and that was the Jewish Museum for um, Antiques and the Antiquity. And that was more for a Jewish audience, because um, people who went there already had a lot of knowledge about these objects. And the Jewish Museums in Germany now, they are very uh, focused on explaining to non-Jews things uh, about Jewish life. So I think that's a very important function they have. But when you open up your perspective, you see that, for example, the Jewish Museum in New York, where the Lübeck Institute is based, has a different perspective on Jewish culture and history. And it's a different audience there as well. It, um, it's also an art museum that collects art, and um, we wouldn't think about that here in the museum. So it has a different function. But I think we all agree that the Jewish Museum in Berlin um, is very, uh, oh, the interpreter lost the sound for a second, now it's back. Um, yes, the Jewish Museum has a very important role to play for the Jewish um, community in Germany. It's probably bigger than um, the community even um, thinks themselves because they like to criticize the museum. Uh, but I think it still has a very big meaning for the community, not only the one in Berlin, but also the one in Frankfurt and in other t cities. Yes, and I think we should honor that. So the multitude of Jewish voices, um, is that a point that you're interested in? Do you think that there is a multitude of Jewish voices in Germany? Well, I um, curated many exhibitions on stories of conflict in Frankfurt, and I do the same in the German Historical Museum but usually not about the present. So I don't see myself as a historian explaining the present. Um, I think um, to understand things as a historian, it's a good idea to let some time pass. So if we look at the Fassbinder controversy, for example, um, Looking back, we get a feeling for what happened back then in the political uh, landscape after the Shoah, or when we look at Bubis and 
the whole discussion about um, boobies that gives us an, a clear impression. But as an historian, I wouldn't say so much about Jewish life today. I think the communities themselves have to answer that question. You mentioned some very important milestones in the history after the war, who questions the uh, question the Jewish-German relationship, and uh, many people were very critical about that. And I have a question from the audience that refers to the multitude of voices. Question by Billy Weitzer. During those three days, there was a lot of uh, conversation about the multitude of uh, Jews in Germany. How should 1,700 years of Jewish life in German-speaking lands be celebrated for those Jews who came to Germany over the last 30 years? And how relevant would they be uh, for them? Why would they be relevant for them? Well, I think um, this multitude of voices is fascinating, and um, its uh, diversity in terms of religion, in terms of country of origin, language, and there's it's a big um, achievement that things are kept together, that uh, the Jewish community uh, runs smoothly and included so many people who came from the former Soviet Union, for example, uh, in the 90s. So all of these people have been integrated really well into the community. So, of course, for young people who came here as children or were born here, um, there are now difficult questions of identity. How religious am I? How Ukrainian am I? How Jewish am I? How German am I? I think these are difficult questions. And in this search of identity, the to look back in history, to be, uh, look back into the Jewish history, uh, I think that can be helpful to, al to answer Billy White's question. I think um, knowing more about the history would be a big com contribution to help with this search of identity. So um, a different narrative about Jewish life in Germany, you mean? Yes. There's another question here from the audience. To look into the future, um, what would you like to happen in the next 10 to 20 years, probably with a view to shared history, you mean? And um, how to handle a Jewish-German history, controversial history? Are there any visions, wishes for the future? Well, it is my impression that the um, idea that institutions like archives or research institutions or museums help people to build up an identity and to shape the future. Um, I'm very skeptical about that. I don't see that at, as our task. For me, as an historian, uh, it's not uh, my it's it's not my job. <laughs> yes, I understand that you are responsible for history. <laughs> yes, um, I um, curated an exhibition on Germany in the German Historical Museum, and um, part of that exhibition was the migration of. Uh, Rus Russian-speaking migrants to Germany. And I think for many people from the former Soviet Union, this was a reason, this exhibition was a reason to come to our German Historical Museum um, because they now felt part of the German history. Before, they weren't so interested in coming to the museum because they weren't so interested in Heine, for example. Uh, they had their own cultural um, canon, their own cultural interests, and um, 
uh, we couldn't tell them to be interested in Braun and Heine just because they had moved to our country. And um, now forget about the uh, day of the victory of the Soviet army. It's not relevant anymore. Now you should care more about the Holocaust Memorial Day. You can't prescribe that to people just because they have migrated. And um, they only became interested in our historical museum because they became part of uh, our exhibition. And um, I think it's Marxist or Leninist if you know what way history should move um, in the future. I think institutions shouldn't work like that and shouldn't think like that. We, we don't, we are, it's not our task to shape identities. And it's not only me as a historian refusing to answer questions about the present. I just think we need to be very clear about what our task is. We offer a forum. We offer the, the liberty, the freedom to talk about topics openly. Uh, we talk about uh, the past. We discuss terminology. And we don't have to agree on anything for the future. OK, maybe. It's different for politicians, isn't it? Politicians are usually interested in shaping the future, aren't they? Well, I have a wish for the future. My wish is that um, we will not have uh, the anti-Semitism that we have in Germany at the moment that we will be able to push that back and give Jews the feeling that they have a safe life in Germany and that they don't have to um, pack the suitcases. Because uh, in 1945, it was actually a miracle that Jews, Jewish uh, citizens stayed in Germany. For many displaced persons, Germany was only um, one place that they had to pass through, but then they kind of got stuck. And um, it's also amazing that there was such a big immigration from of Jews into Germany in the 90s. I, I find that a miracle, I find that astonishing. And uh, my vision for the next 10 years would be that um, those people, uh, those Jewish citizens in Germany feel at home and feel safe. Well, uh, it's interesting that you talk about getting the suitcases from the basement because I grew up as a Jew in Western Berlin with that um, feeling of sitting on packed suitcases. It was uh, highly debated in the Jewish families in um, my um, surroundings. And then most suitcases were unpacked in the mm, year, around the year 2000. And a new generation grew up that um, felt much more self-confident as part of German society. And over the last years, uh, this um, feeling is again weakened, this feeling of safety. Another interesting question from the audience. If you speak about the second and third generation uh, of um, Holocaust survivors, can we also talk about the second or third generation of perpetrators? How do you see that? Yes, of course. And this is something that, from my point of view, we don't discuss enough, at least not in my bubble. Let me give you one interesting example. Um, I know one person who has thought a lot about the topic, Alexandra Senft, the story of her family uh, that included one big Nazi uh, criminal who was uh, put to death uh, later. He uh, committed uh, lots of crimes in Slovakia and Alexandra Senft did a lot of research and wrote a fascinating uh, account of that part of history and put it in an, a fascinating context. And I think her work is extremely productive. You can learn a lot from that. And I think um, you can learn about mechanisms that um, influence our society until today, much more than we think. 
much more than we would like to believe and much more than uh, we um, understand when we only identify with the stories of Holocaust survivors. I think it's much more difficult to face the memories and history of the perpetrators um, and to be interested in that. But I think it would be extremely important. I have another question from the audience, but I think we're not the right persons to answer that question, to be honest. But I'm going to tell you what it is anyway. The question is where the deficits are when we talk about the integration uh, of the Russian-speaking migrants to Germany. Were there any deficits and what aspects did you observe in the develop or surprised you in the Russian speaking community over the last 30 years. I don't think it's the right panel for that here, but do you have any opinions on that? Anything you have observed? Maybe private opinions? 30 years after the transformation. Oh, I don't know whether you need a, a specific panel t to talk about these 30 years. But uh, yes, it is a very um, central focal issue. Dmitry Baiki uh, spoke about the German Jewry 2.0. And to come back to the Leo Beck Institute, um, he said that the era of the German Jewry uh, ended in 1933. And I take this very seriously, and I was a director of the Lebeck Institute for 15 years, and I think this is right, because what we are having uh, now, uh, Jewish life, is not the same Jewish life that we had before 1933. It's something completely different, and um, it's not an... Uh, it's not a judgment and it's not, uh, I don't want to value it, but it's um, a completely different story. We need the different observation for this, but it has been done in, in many ways in different conferences and research. And we've had uh, conferences on the integration of Russian Jews at Leo Beck Institute for the last 10 years. And um, I don't know how this can be seen as a joint, as a common history, or assessed as a common history. But this is uh, the task uh, a historian should, should do. But this is also an important topic in the Jewish uh, Museum of Berlin, the immigration of Jews from the former Soviet states. And there is a whole department um, dedicated to this topic. Well, yeah, many, many questions, of course. Uh, this is something that we expected, actually. And thank you very much for your thoughts, for your ideas. Uh, Ms. Kuchler, Ms. Uh, Mr. Gross, thank you. Thank the virtual audience. I hope that you've learned new things uh, in this conference and that it uh, has given you some food for thought. And I would be happy to see you at some place, New York or somewhere else, um, at the next conference. Now I will pass uh, the floor to William Weitzer to New York. Billy, the floor, Billy, the floor is yours. Good evening. I want to thank Shelley, Raphael, and Michaela for a wonderful conversation. Um, I was smiling while you struggled with the definition of shared history. Uh, the uh, please note that the uh, topic was with a question mark, and you uh, did question it a lot and, and had a very good conversation about that. Um, it has been an amazing three days of panels, papers, uh, and even virtual coffee breaks. Well, I'm certain that um, everyone has had enough screen time this week and throughout the pandemic. I ask that you spare me two minutes to extend some thanks. Um, First off, uh, to all of you for listening, asking questions, and putting up with technological challenges. Uh, to our funders, the German Foreign Ministry and the Beipa Bay. Uh, to the facility support from the Jewish Museum Berlin as a, a great partner. Um, for the participation by opening and closing panelists, paper session chairs, and those who wrote papers. Uh, and to the translators who uh, helped us in both languages. 
And uh, last but not least, to the staff support from so many at the Leo Beck Institute, but especially Milena Rink and Miriam Bistrovich from our Berlin office. Finally, I ask that everyone listening stay connected to the Shared History Project during the coming year, starting with our virtual uh, exhibit that was mentioned tonight that will reveal each week a new object, essays, and related information about Jewish life in German-speaking lands. And for those of you who are in Berlin, I hope you'll be able to visit our physical exhibit, which opens in late January in the Bundestag and will be there until the end of April. Thank you. Please give us feedback uh, on our project. As I said, please participate. Stay and stay safe and well in the coming days and weeks.